Which brings me to persistent contrails. Uh, all but the willfully ignorant uh, know our skies have changed dramatically over the last few decades. Uh, the dark blue skies of our childhood have been replaced with a milky white haze, crisscrossed with fast expanding persistent contrails, stretching from horizon to horizon and spreading out to cover the sky. These trails can stretch for thousands of miles and can be seen by anyone visiting nasa.gov. These trails persist regardless of altitude, temperature, humidity, or other atmospheric conditions. Persistent contrails used to be rare, but have now become an everyday phenomenon all over the world. If physics hasn't changed, what has? So what makes these trails form, persist for hours and stretch thousands of miles? Which condensation nuclei are they forming on, and are these harmful to human health? Geoengineers propose spraying tens of millions of tons of reflective particles into the atmosphere in an attempt to reflect sunlight back into space and thereby reduce global warming. This is known as solar radiation management, stratospheric aerosol injection, or albedo modification. This process, patented by defense contractor Raytheon, is quite simple. Tiny particles sprayed from jets would act as condensation nuclei, attracting atmospheric water vapor to form persistent artificially nucleated contrails, which would then spread out and form artificial cloud cover, artificial cirrus cloud cover. When geoengineers discuss radi solar radiation management in public, the only substances they say they'd consider spraying are sulfates or sulfuric acid. However, their own literature concludes that sulfates have limited effectiveness and that highly toxic nanoparticles of aluminum and barium should be used instead. And when confronted, they doggedly refuse to address the human health impacts of their proposals. Other geoengineers are more candid about their plans to poison the sky. Stanford's Ken Caldera admitted in an interview in 2006 that he discussed putting pathogens in clouds to wage chemical and germ warfare on civilian populations when he worked at a government weapons lab. It's no surprise that the public doubts these scientists have their best interests at heart. Last month I brought uh, this paper to the Paris Climate Conference uh, addressing the uh, human health impacts of proposed geoengineering engineering solutions. I formally request it be entered into the record. Uh, it documents the dramatic increase in Alzheimer's and respiratory failure since the 1990s when persistent contrails became commonplace around the world. I conclude that these persistent contrails are in fact artificially nucleated with the same toxic particulate metals outlined in Raytheon's patent and that a solar radiation management program has been deployed since at least the 1990s. Weather modification research is nothing new. The earliest patent dates back to 1920. Uh, Raytheon's patent proposes reducing global warming by injecting aluminum, thorium, and other metallic oxides in the 10 to 100 micron range into the stratosphere using jet exhaust. The US Navy patented another delivery method which forms artificially nucleated contrails from metal oxides with a 0.3 micron particle size. Other methods include airships, rockets, chimneys, and slurry pipes. The best known proponent of solar radiation management is Dr. David Keith. He told the 2010 annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science that aluminum oxide has four times the volumetric radiative forcing uh, for small particles as does sulfur and 16 times less the coagulation rate. Sulfur particles stick together and quickly fall out of the stratosphere and are much less effective per unit mass. He also said a nanofabrication study proved it was very simple to spray high quality aluminum particles from a plane by injecting aluminum vapor into the exhaust. His 2010 paper, Photophoretic Levitation of Engineered Aerosols for Geoengineering, proposes spraying 50 nanometer thick disks of aluminum, barium, titanium, instead of sulfates. Pope et al. also concluded aluminum nanoparticles are much more effective than sulfates in a 2010 perspective in nature climate change. The material safety data sheet for nanoparticulate aluminum uh, uh, states it's an irritant to the respiratory system, is implicated in Alzheimer's disease, can cause pulmonary disease, tumors, neoplasms, and, sh and should not be released into the environment without proper governmental permits. Alzheimer's disease rose to the sixth leading cause of death in the United States uh, from the eighth between 1999 and 2013. In 1994, it didn't even make the top 10. Now people in their 20s are showing signs of Alzheimer's. Research shows that aluminum accumulates in the brain, bones, and kidneys, is a neurotoxin, accelerates brain aging, increases oxidative stress and inflammation of the brain, and is seven times more bioavailable when inhaled than when ingested orally. Barium is much deadlier. 
According to its material safety data sheet, exposure to barium salts can cause pulmonary arrest, vomiting, diarrhea, convulsive tremors, muscular paralysis, shock, convulsions, and sudden cardiac failure. Barium targets the cardiovascular, nervous, gastrointestinal, hematology, respiratory, reproductive, and renal systems, as well as the adrenal glands and liver. It is also an irritant to the skin and should not be released into the environment. In 2011, respiratory failure overtook stroke to become the third leading cause of death in the United States at a time when smoking was at an all-time low, emission standards on vehicles and power plants were at their strictest, and heavy industry had relocated to China. Hundreds of scientific papers thoroughly proved the toxicity of both aluminum and barium. It would take days to cover a fraction of the proof. According to EPA, particulate pollution can cause early death from heart attack, stroke, congestive heart failure, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It also causes asthma and inflammation of lung tissue and may cause cancer, reproductive and development, developmental harm. Particulate pollution can lower life expectancy by one to three years. Water and ice have refractive indices of 1.333 and 1.309 respectively and produce rainbows with an angular radius of 42 degrees centered on the antisolar point. But in recent years, a formerly rare phenomenon has become commonplace, a 21 degree halo completely encircling the sun. Some argue that these halos, or incredibly rare sun dogs, are formed by ice crystals, but nothing can change the refractive index of water and ice, which forms 42 degree halos. Metal salts have a higher refractive index and therefore form much tighter halos. Uh, crystalline aluminum oxide, uh, for example, has a refractive index of 1.762 to 1.778, while barium sulfate has a refractive index of 1.636. My contention that these incredibly rare sun dogs are in fact formed by metal salts with a higher refractive index than water is reinforced by rainwater analysis taken during a 30-day period when I recorded 21 of these halos in uh, March, April 2015. I collected rainwater in clean glass bowls on the roof of my San Francisco apartment building on April 5th, 6,000 miles downwind from the nearest factory, power plant, refinery, freeway, quarry, or mine. I sent it to a NELAP certified lab, and they recorded barium at a staggering 160 micrograms per liter. Less than one gram will kill an adult human. An earlier test of rainwater collected in January 14 recorded aluminum at 190 micrograms per liter. I submit both these uh, rainwater tests to the, for the record. San Francisco's air should be pristine. We get prevailing winds off the Pacific Ocean. Why is it less left to concerned citizens to pay for our own rainwater analysis? And why did, the, why did EPA stop publishing data on airborne aluminum back in 2002? Let me take this opportunity to formally submit a freedom of information request for EPA to release the historical results of all metal tests in our air and rainwater from the 1980s to present. I have recorded hundreds of time-lapse videos showing the progression of these persistent contrails since 2011. Thousands of others worldwide have also documented the alarming increase of these persistent contrails. Uh, oh, sorry. This directly. Thousands of others worldwide have also documented the alarming increase of these persistent contracts. Why is the EPA claiming that six greenhouse gases emitted from jet planes are a threat to human health under the Clean Air Act while doing nothing to address ongoing lawsuits over leaded aviation gasoline or the real health concerns of stakeholders worldwide? Cancer causing heavy metals and fuels and their additives <clears throat> and aviation induced cloudiness. You, the EPA, claim the authority to regulate aviation emissions under the Clean Air Act, a law that should protect us from the aforementioned poisonous pollution. However, the definition of pollution is being perverted to mean climate change gases in what can only be called a violation of the spirit of the law. Air pollution which may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. That's the quote. As you can see by the wording in the Clean Air Act, lead, barium, aluminum, and trade secret toxic chemicals clearly present a greater danger to public health than greenhouse gases, no matter how much climate science you accumulate. Furthermore, material safety data sheets of aviation fuel and their additives almost always contain the same warning, do not dump in water. Yet, raw fuel dumping or burning these chemicals, dangerous chemicals and then dumping them in water is somehow safe. Finally, despite great efforts to find bioaccumulation or biomagnification studies on precipitated aviation pollutants, none seem to exist. 
The EPA and Obama administration are ignoring the global outrage over the most visible climate change concern from airplanes, cloud creation. Do a search for the word chemtrails on the internet and you will see millions of concerned citizens who look up and wonder what in the world are they spraying. Despite what you may think of the myriad of maladies attributed to these clouds, the global outrage is nonetheless clear. They are right to be worried and we should all be concerned. The EPA's claim that CO2 is a greater threat to human health than contrails and aviation-induced cloudiness is based on incomplete IPCC data that downplays the effects of contrails on our climate. The IPCC's fourth, ass fourth assessment of contrail radiative forcing only accounted for linear contrails, meaning any contrail that spreads out and turns into cirrus clouds was not accounted for. How significant is this heat-trapping contrail conundrum? Quote, Contrails formed by aircraft can evolve into cirrus clouds indistinguishable from those formed naturally. These spreading contrails may be causing more climate warming today than all the carbon dioxide emitted by aircraft since the start of aviation. Another researcher stated a single aircraft operating in conditions favorable for persistent contrail formation appears to exert a contrail induced radiative forcing some 5,000 times greater than the estimates of the average persistent contrail radiative forcing from the entire civil aviation fleet. Why did I lose my place? Although this research has now been incorporated into the IPCC computer models and revised down, in my opinion, these claims highlight gaping holes in climate science. As of 2013, quote, aerosol cloud interactions are, the, are one of the main uncertainties in climate research. Scientific understanding of how contrails transition into cirrus clouds is severely lacking but rapidly evolving with the latest research showing that cirrus clouds are filled with metal aerosols from human sources. Quote, the big one we found is lead coming from things like tetraethyl lead in fuels still used today in light aviation. So that's probably the biggest metal that we find or the most frequent metal that we find, but we find a whole host of different metals actually. Apparently small amounts of metal particulates have major effects on cirrus clouds. Quote, it would seem that you would have to change all of the aerosol in the atmosphere very radically to get a big, different on, big effect on the clouds but because mineral dust and metallic particles are such a small amount of the particulate matter, just a percent or two, it means that you only have to change about a percent or two of the particles to get a big effect on these clouds. The latest research casts doubts on the IPCC's contrail assumptions and requires serious consideration when addressing the real climate change impact of aviation. High altitude metals and cirrus cloud condensation nuclei are likely coming from leaded ab gas and jet exhaust. Contrails are making cirrus clouds and small changes in atmospheric metal have large impacts on cirrus cloud creation. Cirrus clouds trap heat and are likely to have a greater impact, climate change impact than CO2. Finally, aviation induced cloudiness endangers future growth in solar energy, affects tourism, spending and is projected to make terrestrial astronomy impossible by 2050. Geoengineering scientists, NASA, NOAA, FAA, USDA, DOE, and international corporate partners are discussing the use of biofuels and sulfur-doped jet fuels for contrail control. This cirrus and cirrus cloud seeding with bismuth, bismuth triiodide to melt these clouds away. The EPA should be directly involved in these discussions. As a result of these recent filings, I, findings, I strongly encourage the EPA to consider expanding the scope of this endangerment to include metal particulates and cloud formation from jet exhaust. If the EPA complies with the spirit of the Clean Air Act, they will protect us from metal aerosols attributed to Alzheimer's, autism, cancer, and a plethora of other debilitating illnesses. If the EPA is truly concerned about aviation-induced climate change, they will regulate the production of contrails and cirrus clouds which change our climate to a much greater extent than the sum of the six greenhouse gases named in this proposal. Regulating heavy metals and aviation-induced cloudiness will be meaningless without proper verification. 
Even though ICAO members sign a binding agreement to only use certain chemicals in their gas tanks, we all know agreements and regulations are useless without proper verification. Therefore, I request mandatory, random testing of jet exhaust be immediately implemented. This is the most important step the EPA can, ta can take to uh, do its due diligence to protect us from harmful pollution and get real-world data to improve future regulations. Most of the data behind this endangerment finding comes from research in highly controlled environments where vari most variables are known. We need verification of non-ideal situations where fuel fouling, fame contamination, or improper maintenance end in vastly different exhaust particulates than seen in lab settings. To achieve verification, I propose that the EPA randomly attach a trailing probe to both foreign and domestic flights then collect and analyze the results to determine real-world exhaust constituents. Alternatively, ground-based LIDAR observations may be possible over fixed high-traffic areas and prevent possible terrorist attacks using aerosols. Either way you choose, we need verification and protection. In conclusion, the EPA should expand this endangerment to include metal aerosols and cloud creation, create a verification system that includes all aircraft, protects us from aviation pollution, holds violators accountable, and commits to better scientific accuracy for future determinations. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of so many who could not be here. Um, and thank you for listening to the, a layperson's views um, on this subject. While I appreciate the efforts of the Center for Biological Diversity, the Sierra Group, and the Friends of the Earth to get the EPA to hold the aviation industry accountable, the poor people like myself have to live near these airports, under these fuel dumps, and under these clouded skies. I hope that some faith can be restored in our EPA by your action here and now. Tell the ICO, ICAO that they will meet your demands and our demands, not the other way around. Thank you very much. So we have the issue of climate engineering. and Semantics are important. The, too much of media and other officials not saying this board, they've been very courteous, but have not used the scientific terms, and this is, this is not used for a reason, because uh, the, the term chemtrails is not a scientific term, so we try to avoid those terms, but when you see CBS News, geoengineering to fight, go fight global warming is now mainstream topic conversation with all scientific organizations and with governmental officials, such as John Holdren, Obama's science advisor who is actively advocating for the use of geoengineering. And again, this is, these are aspects that media does not cover because this would legitimize this issue. This would bring credibility to it. So we do have, again, science data that's it's too extensive to document here, but when we have current administration officials advocating for these programs and the immediate need to implement these programs, this subject should not be marginalized as it typically is by media. When we have, this is, this is from MIT, this diagram is from MIT where you clearly see an aircraft spraying particulates out the back. Now, again, this is mainstream scientific discussion. We have every major science institution talking about these issues right now, that, that these programs must be implemented. And so again, when, what we ask is that this issue be given attention and our point here today, irregardless of where the contamination is coming from over Shasta County and the rest of the globe, we ask that the science be looked at and, and that the legitimacy of this issue be acknowledged with the science terms, that this is brought to public attention and brought into a public dialogue. This is, again, only the tip of the iceberg for what's available for documentation. This is a 40-page congressional research document, Geoengineering Governance and Technology. There's a, a number of documents like this. We have, even going back to the 60s, for example, we have 80-page presidential documents outlining the scope and scale of these programs even back that far. We see skies like this. Certainly, we have a lot of people telling us this is normal commercial traffic. It is, it's, it, this, is, this is normal. Good job.
Sometimes you have to go to those crowds and then they'll put out, still ride out and you make them bigger. Look, there's two of them. One just turned on. So they're trying to build up this cloud here, it looks like. They're trying to join these clouds together, I think. Look, he's curving around. He's going to curve around probably all over the city now. Yeah. Both of them. Let's just crisscross now. When they crisscross, you know they're going to be doing something. You see it pulling across the other way. Yeah. Yeah, they're making, they're doing something, they're doing a... Maybe they're bombers. They're gonna bomb them. Big jets, whatever they are. Look, he shut off. You can tell that's not a... Uh, you know, that's the way the jet should be. A shut off like that. He's completely shut off. Look, he disappeared now. They're both, they both shut off. So what, this is probably gonna be a mix. Turned off and then turned on. Yeah. 